we've got uh, a number of uh, things we're going to talk about today, and I'm going to do my very best to show you how I apply these techniques to be forward predictive in, uh, in, in the financial markets. We're going to talk a lot about cycles today and where they come from. And uh, to that extent, I thought I'd just share a moment with you outlining my own background. I have an undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering from the uh, University of Texas. And shortly after school, I went to the Navy. I was a, a naval aviator. I uh, flew the, uh, the F-4 Phantom, uh, the F-14 Tomcat, and the F-18 Hornet for a number of years. Um, after the Navy, I went back to grad school, got a master's degree, and I worked as a uh, project manager at Northrop Grumman for a number of years on, uh, on fighter aircraft development. Well, for the last 20-so uh, years or so, I've been uh, involved with uh, Harley Capital Management, my own business entity, and I've been publishing the Harley Market Letter. This is the aircraft I used to fly, the F-14 Tomcat, getting ready to take off. Here's a picture of me uh, on television a few years ago with Richard Saxon in the Los Angeles area. I was a frequent guest market analyst on that station. Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about cycles. Specifically, we're going to talk about exactly where they come from. And I'm going to show you precisely how one can predict turning points before we get there. Markets go up and down, as you all know, but it's not black magic and witchcraft. There is absolute order here to the markets. Um, the problem, of course, is, uh, is, is where does this all come from? What is the math behind it? And I'm going to show you exactly the answer to that problem. And then we're going to look at real-time market stocks, bonds, and we're going to look at the Case-Shiller Home Price Index. There I am presenting at a, at a recent uh, money show in New York. A number of years ago, I gravitated to the, uh, the science of market cycles. Uh, in, in, uh, in my undergraduate training as an aerospace engineer, my block field of study was harmonic vibrations. And I, started, I studied uh, vibrational functions. And, uh, and the, uh, the math that described those functions was extremely complex. But nevertheless, I was able to uh, forecast movements in solid objects as well as liquid mediums. And while the, the, the formulas are considerably different in the markets, the premise is still the same nonetheless. And that is markets go up and down, as do solid objects, as do uh, fluid mediums. And these up and down movements are very predictable. We just need to understand the math behind it. And we need to get sufficient amount of data to analyze it. Let's look at numbers. A number of years ago, an Italian mathematician made a, uh, made a trip to, to Egypt. He found there a, uh, a series of numbers that uh, have, have since borne his name. They're called the Fibonacci numbers. And I suspect most of you uh, watching these broadcasts are familiar with them. But if you're not, here is the sequence. It begins with 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, and so forth. Uh, one can readily see that each two numbers, when added together, yields the third number in succession. So for example, 2 plus 3 equals 5, 5 and 3 is 8, 8 and 13 is, two, is 21, and so on. Well, most market technicians are familiar with these numbers. Uh, technicians use them to count forward in time from important high and low pivot points to forecast market reversals. And one can use these ratios in, uh, in price ratio prediction as well, either for retracement prediction or advancement prediction. What is not known is what I'm about to show you here, and that is this. Um, kind of like Isaac Newton sitting under the apple tree. One day it just kind of fell down and bonked me on the head. But I uh, categorized movements in the markets, either lows to lows or highs to highs, or lows to highs and highs to lows, and I saw a series of numbers in all my empirical data that seemed to recur over and over. And I saw, for example, patterns that, that oscillated around the number 40, or around the number 64, 80, and so on. I saw these recurring numbers over and over, and I racked my brain until the cows came home, and finally 
just the apple fell out of the tree, bumped me on the head, and the thought to take the Fibonacci series and divide by the square root of five just suddenly appeared to me here. And then I produced these series of numbers that you can see here, 24.6, 39.8, and so forth. Each one of these uh, comes as a result of taking the Fibonacci series and dividing by the square root of five. And then I do some additional ma manipulation. I double them, I have them, and that sort of thing. But uh, but the end result is these numbers right here, these aren't all of them, but these are the majority of them, uh, tend to uh, be the predictive element in all market cycles across all time frames we see. And these, among that list, these are probably the most important ones right here. This one right here, 39.8, shows up time after time after time. And its formula is derived, derived by taking the Fibonacci number 89 and dividing by the square root of 5. The double of that, which I call the duplex function, is 79.6. And the double of that, again, is 159.2. And these numbers are probably the most prevalent in all financial markets. I see them all the time on yearly charts, monthly charts, weekly charts, daily charts, hourly charts. And these numbers down here, 49.2, which comes from the Fib number 55, divided by the square root of 5, and so on. This appears quite frequently in the markets as well, time after time after time. Okay, how do I use all this, you ask? Well, here's a recent chart of the Dow Jones Industrials, and from that last table, I've reproduced those numbers right here, 89, 89 divided by square root 5, 39.8, the double of that 79.6, and then I multiplied 79.6 by a couple of very common Fibonacci ratios, 3A2 and 618. I get these four numbers. And by golly, these numbers show up on charts of the stock market all the time. Take a look at this. Between these two lows, 32 trading days, 49 trading days, 29 trading days, 46, 46, and so on. What I've done here is I've put in, in, in just straight digit form the length between this trough and this trough, and then in parentheses, the actual six, cyclical function that's in play. So 46 trading days means the 49.2 uh, trading day cycle was uh, operative, defining these two bottoms, and so on. The square root of 5 is, uh, is uh, the uh, underlying factor in, in the Fibonacci series. Uh, and and it, 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 it is used in deriving the Fibonacci series themselves. It's also used in deriving a number of ratios. Uh, for example, the ratio is 1.618 and 0 0.618. I'm sure many of you viewing this presentation are familiar with those ratios. What you may not be familiar with is what is the the mathematical formula that, uh, that derives these. Of course, one can take the two, take two Fibonacci numbers in succession and divide by them. Either way, and you'll get these ratios. Or a more exact result is this. The square root 5 plus 1 divided by 2 is 1.618. And the square root of 5 minus 1 divided by 2 equals 0 0.618. Those are very common. Uh, most folks uh, are well versed in those ratios, but there are a few others that, uh, that I have found that are extremely important as well. And here they are. Uh, here is uh, 0.618 and it's inverse 3A2. I show the math here. Two other ratios that I have found uh, that show up time and time again are 0.447 and 0.553. And as you can see, both of those are close to one half, but not exactly one half. And the way I found that is just by looking at charts, I found that uh, between two cycles there was a, a sub-cycle, and uh, very frequently it would be to the, a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right of the halfway point. And I set about scratching my head and sitting under that old apple tree, and Cabal got hit on the head and played with numbers and found out if I took 1 divided by the square root of 5, I get this number, 0 
and the inverse of that is 0.553. And those ratios are just as common as 618, 1.618.382. And there's another um, pair of, uh, of unitary numbers uh, that show up a lot, and that is 0.236 and 0.764, and there's the math that describes those. And I call these three sets of ratios unitary Fibonacci ratios. Because unitary meaning they add up to one. 382618 adds up to one, 447553, and 236764. And believe me, these three sets of unitary ratios um, apply to probably 90% of what you'll see in the financial markets. Um, 0.809 and 0.191, there's, there's another pair, but uh, these are by far and away the most common. Here I come in my F14 Tomcat, making a supersonic pass. Let's take this theory that I presented and let's apply it real time to these markets and let's see if it works. If it does, then we have a, a valid theory that we can use to predict market reversals. By way of backdrop, let's just take a look at some manias that have occurred in the past. And then I'm going to use these as a tool to show you what I see happening here real time. Some of you may be familiar with the, uh, the so-called tulip mania, which took place in the Netherlands back in the 1600s. And uh, the price of tulips just skyrocketed the Dutch back in that era were the dominant uh, trading force uh, in the world. Uh, their their uh, commercial operations spanned uh, North America, of course Europe, and, and over into uh, the India subcontinent. Uh, the Dutch uh, came to the New World before the British did, as you know. They founded what is now called New York. Back then it was called New Amsterdam, uh, but the British bought it from the Dutch. Uh, uh, but my point is, uh, tulips then were, because the Dutch were doing so well, were in very high demand, and the price of tulips went up, 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 and finally reached a cladicismic top, and then collapsed. The next major bubble took place in the 1720s. That was when uh, Great Britain, of course, had, uh, had taken over as the dominant commercial and, and military force on the planet. They were the reigning superpower of the day, as you all know. Um, but in the 1720s, uh, this company, which was the Microsoft of, of that era, the South Sea Trading Company. Uh, their commercial operations spanned in North America, Europe, and also the India subcontinent. Um, the price of their stock went right to the moon and then collapsed. Um, as a footnote, Isaac Newton, who was then the Chancellor of the Exchequer, sort of like a combination of our uh, um, Federal Reserve Chairman and, uh, and Treasury Secretary, uh, he traded this stock and he held it right into the top and then it collapsed and Isaac Newton who was a brilliant brilliant man he developed the laws of calculus uh, he died penniless this collapse in this stock uh, sent him to the poorhouse 1929 another bubble top collapse into the 32 bottom okay by that by way of backdrop let's look at some interesting charts here is the Dow Jones Industrials, going back to 1600. Getting data going back this far is, is very, very difficult, I'll tell you. Um, but it can be had. Um, the data uh, prior to uh, 1792 is appended from the British stock market because the U.S. market didn't start trading until 1792. So uh, from this point to the left, this is London data merged with U.S. data. Nevertheless, it gives us a very, very good picture of what's going on. And this is current right through the present time frame. Over here on the left, 1637. I put a dot there. There are no subsequent dots because I don't have the data uh, for or how the London Stock Exchange traded throughout this time period. My data picks up right here in the late 1600s. Um, but I do know, of course, in February of 1637, we had the tulip mania. And I've denoted that right here. The South Sea bubble, the next one that we talked about here uh, is denoted here in 1720, and then we had a peak in 1835 in the U.S. stock market, and then we underwent a just a horrible, horrible uh, economic decline. Uh, many, many banks collapsed in this country, farmers went broke, it was, it was brutal. And of course, uh, 
a lot of folks may not recognize this, but this was the this was the economic uh, impetus for the start of the Civil War in this country. The next bubble top occurred in 1929, and the next one I believe is occurring right now. Okay, what can we glean from this, from what I already told you about where I think cycles come from, and how does it apply? Well, let's just take a look at this time spans between these bubble top peaks. 83 years, 115 years, 94 years, 86 years. Most people probably wouldn't recognize any discernible pattern there, but let's take a look at some of these numbers that, that I just showed you previously. If we take the Fibonacci number 377, divide by the square root of 5, that comes up to be 168.6. That was on the tabular listing I showed you just a little while ago. And take half of that, we get 84.3. 84.3, 83 years. And also in the present time frame. If we, double, if we go back to the double of that, which I call the duplex function, 168.6. Um, cycles uh, expand and contract, um, and and that's that's makes my job as an analyst, your job as an analyst, a little bit challenging. They're not always exact, but they do expand and contract, and they tend to expand and contract by some of these ratios that I showed you just a little while ago. So 1.1 1 1, or 168.6. If it were to expand to 1.236 by that ratio, that would yield a function of 208.4 years. And by multiplying 208.4 by these two ratios that I showed you earlier, 447 and 553, we get these two numbers, 93.2 and 115.2. Now let's go back down here. 83 years, that's my 84.3 year cycle. 115 years, that's 115.2 right there. 94 years, that's 93.2, right there. 86, we're 1.7 years beyond the ideal 84.3 years. And incidentally, we are just a smidge over 377 Fibonacci years from the Tulip Mania peak. So do you see some order here? Do you see some math? Cycles are like an accordion. They contract and expand. Rarely are they right on the button, and when they are, that makes it nice, but that's unusual. What one has to do is one has to recognize that cycles expand and contract, and through experience, one has to understand the, the typical contraction and expansion functions, which I'm showing you here today, and then one has to have enough data. You only look at just a couple of bits of data, that's generally not enough. Uh, what is enough has to be determined by um, the matters at hand. Okay, let's take this same chart and let's look at it a different way. Um, frequently on the same price chart, one will see a multitude of cycles at play at the same time. And what I do as an analyst, as an analyst is I want to analyze that and I want to look for a clustering effect. And it is when I get a clustering effect if I get a number of different cycles clustering within a narrow window of time, that heightens the potential for a, a, a trend change in the markets. Okay, here's the same chart that I showed previously, but now I have identified a different cyclical function. This is based on the number 49.2, which we talked about earlier. And that, of course, comes from 55 divided by the square root of 5 times 2, 49.2. And I found overwhelming evidence overwhelming evidence of a 49.2 year in the in the stock market beginning with the tulip mania. We already showed you evidence of an 84.3 year, now I'm showing you evidence of a 49.2 year. Here's the tulip mania, here's the uh, 1720 top, and if you take 49.2 multiplied by 1.618, you get 79.6, and this was 83 years, so it just expanded by just about three years. And here, here I've shown 1.618, 3, 4, 5 skipped, 6, 7, and 7.618. At the fourth, in other words, 49.2 times 4 lines up right here. And look at that. It 
nail the 1835 top. Okay, if we take this and we multiply by 5, nothing really happened here. I mean, those were some big tops and bottoms at the time. But on the grand scale of things, and this is a log chart, by the way, they weren't that important. I'm looking for the major, major highs and lows. And cycles do this, by the way. They sometimes skip a beat. And, oh, boy, that makes the analysis process a little bit challenging. But it's the way it is. That's the way it is, folks. Uh, number six times 49.2 lined up, I mean, within a month or two of the July 1932 bottom. Number seven times 49.2 lined up, again, with a month or two of the August 82 bottom. And if we were to go 7.618, it lines up with the early part of 2015. I've taken those data points and I've done what's called a regression analysis of the data. That is, uh, regression analysis allows one to find the least squares best, best fit of all the data. So I don't want you to get too lost in all these numbers. I've done the math for you. I plugged in all the dates from the prior chart. There's the, the, the top in 1637, the major bottom in 1784, and so on. Plugged all of these in and, uh, and found out the least squares best fit for that entire data series for the last 378 years says the next occurrence should happen in the vicinity of 2013. But well, we're at 2015 right now. But also bear in mind that any form of data analysis has what's called standard deviation. And that's what this is right here. So this says of this data series, the one standard deviation, that is there's a 68% probability that it would occur within 0.79 years. Two standard deviations would be 1.6 years, and three standard deviations would be 2.4 years from this date. And we are certainly within just a smidge over two standard deviations of that. And look how reliable this cycle has been. This cycle, historically, over the last 377 years, has not been off by more than one year. One year. And the R squared, for those of you who have a background in statistics, you know that an R squared value of 1.0 is a perfect fit of the data. This is 9999. That's four nines and a six. That means this cycle is a very, very good cycle. And it's expanding a little bit right now. And that's what typically happens when you get to the tail end of a move. A cycle will distort. It undergoes what I call unusual distortion, more than the prior data points. That's very, very common. It's expanding a little bit. And oh, by the way, the regression analysis computes the cycle length of 49.3 years. And my theory, based on 55 divided by square root 5, says it should be 49.2. OK, let's take this down, this data, and let's break it down even further. Here is the here this is these these are this is a daily chart of data going back to the September 1929 peak all the way through last Friday's close. And I've done the math. If you take this ratio or this, this distance in trading days, one half of that distance occurs at the January 73 top. 0.618 of this distance occurs right at the August 9, 1982 bottom. Ah, uh, and what is this date right here? Well, I'm going to show you that here shortly. We have some other cycles coming into play. This is a monthly chart going back to the 1973 top. As you can see, I'm, I'm starting with a very large picture, and I'm narrowing the view closer and closer in time. With, a, with this, First with years, then months, then we're going to look at weeks, then we're going to look at days. We started with looking at 307, almost 400 years. Now we're looking at the last 40 years. And look at the cycles that I've highlighted here with these blue arrows. And just with your Mark 1A eyeball, you can see they're pretty much equidistant apart, except over here we expand it a little bit. And again, there's my number 39.8. You know, it rained 40 days, 40 nights. You've probably heard or, heard or read about that. 
There it is right there. There's the math. Doubling it, 79.6. 79.6. And you, you can see it's off a little bit. Expands and contracts a little bit. Here it was contracting. Here it's expanding. And uh, when you put it all together, it says a high is due very, very soon. Let's look at the weekly chart. I'm sorry, the, uh, it, it's a monthly chart, but I have a trading day counts labeled on here. Uh, here's the math. Here are the Fibonacci numbers divided by the square root of 5, producing these cyclical functions. And I have counted forward in time from these past high and low pivot points. And as you can see, and as I'm narrowing this down, we're getting a phenomenal clustering <coughs> around March 17th, 18th, 2015, just a little over two months from now. Reed, I think we may have somebody else's microphone on. You can check that, please. Sorry about that. You should be good to go, though. All right. Thank you. Here is a, a daily chart of the Dow Industrials. This is current through last Friday. And what I've done here is I've highlighted these dominant turns over the last year, and they are all related by, I think you've seen these numbers before, 49.2. These numbers, these same numbers pop up time and time again on yearly charts monthly charts, weekly charts, daily charts. And clustering in and around the March 11th to March 18th time period of 2015 is substantial. Here's the S&P 500. I've also labeled the uh, trading cycle lows. The dominant trading cycle uh, uh, for the stock market um, is 39.8 days. And as you can see, I've noted with vertical lines here, the troughs, the bottom to bottom sequences, and I put down here the time span in trading days. From here to here, 46 trading days. From here to here, 23. From here to here, 58. From here to here, 48. 43, 21. Well, at first glance, you look at that and you say, well, how can I make any utility of that? Well, I invite you to take your calculator and average 21, 43, 48, 58, 23, 46. You'll get exactly 39.8. Oh, by the way, and if we take the low that occurred on Friday and we add 39.8 days to it, it lines up with March 17, 2015. couple of indicators that I use. One, I measure price velocity. Some people call this indicator momentum, a rate of change. I'm an engineer. I don't like the term momentum because momentum is mass times velocity and there is no mass. <laughs> so I call it price velocity. And what I do is I look at today's price versus X number of days ago, make that calculation, smooth it, uh, and then I plot three time periods on the same graph. And that's what I can't emphasize that enough. When you're looking at indicators, the structure of the indicator will change depending on what time period you're choosing. And the time period of selection is dependent upon the cycle. Well, that presupposes you know what the cycle is. Well, the average cycle is 39.8 days. I know that, and you now know that. But it contracts and expands. So to get around that problem, you need to look at multiple time frames for your calculations. And I use 7, 14, and 40. And by looking at all three, I get a good picture of what's happening in the market. This is a speedometer. 
All it does is tell me how fast the market is going up and down, and it defines the cycles. And you can see we're getting some structure right in here, and I believe this is going to turn up here following today. This is the other indicator I use. Um, this is a percentage range, and what I do is I, I look at X number of days in the past, and I say, okay, what is today's price versus where it was, in this case, 54 days ago, is a ratio between 0 and 100, and I plot that data point, and then I smooth it with a 20-period and a 5-period smoothing function. And I also perform this calculation over multiple time frames as well. If I want to go long, I want to see both sets of indicators rising. If I want to go short, I want to see both sets of indicators declining. If this one's going up and this one's going down, or vice versa, you're in trouble. Uh, don't take the trade. It means the market's going sideways, or there's some confusion there, or it's in a, a narrow band of congestion, uh, but it certainly heightens the risk un, um, unacceptably, in my view, unless you've got both sets of indicators heading higher or heading lower. Okay, we're going to have to pick up the pace here because I see we're, we're getting a little short on time. Um, there's also a four-year cycle in the stock market. I'm sure most of you have probably heard of that. Where does a four-year cycle come from? Well, there it is right there. It's 49.2 49 months. 48 months would be four years. There's the math that defines the four-year cycle. Let's look at bonds very quickly. Here's the bond data going back to the uh, 1800s. And uh, this is actually yield, 30-year yield. And remember my number, 39.8? Look at this. Look where I put the red arrows. Every 39.8-point year, year, 39.8, there, you can say it. <laughs> like clockwork. Uh, oh, you know, plus or minus two or three, left or right. We tend to get, get major trend changes in the bond market. The next 39.8-year cycle is due to resolve about 39, call it 40 years from the 1981 peak, 2021. So all this talk about rates going up, rates going up, psh, nonsense, nonsense. Rates are heading lower. Now in the short term, in the short term, they don't go, they're not, the bond prices are not heading higher and rates are not heading lower without some uh, permutations along the way. Uh, I think we're right near a peak here, short term. Long term, I'm a bull. In the short term here, I think uh, we, we may see prices retrace a, a bit. Uh, with red arrows here, I've highlighted a cyclical function. Again, it comes from my number 39.8. Multiply that by 12, get 477.6. And every 477.6 days, plus or minus, we get high points in the bond market, or low points in yield. Let's take a look at the one last uh, data series, home prices. You own a home, you're probably very interested in this. This is uh, the Case-Shiller Index uh, nationwide going back to uh, the 1800s, and I found overwhelming evidence of a 53-year cycle in the data. I won't spend a lot of time on the derivation, uh, but, uh, but uh, what I've done is uh, looked at the daily, I mean, I looked at the, uh, the yearly data and the monthly data. Uh, this is the national index on a monthly basis. The blue represents monthly data, and this comes out, as you know, on the last Tuesday of every month. The red is an 18-month moving average. Simple technical analysis here. Just look where the blue crosses the red, and there's your buy signal. And when it crosses to the downside, there's your sell signal and housing right there. Okay, and then it crosses back above, there's the buy signal. And at some point, we're going to top out up here. Where do I think that's going to be? Well, there's the answer to that question. I've looked at this peak, June 1990. This is the LA area index, which has the same structure as the national index, just a little bit more volatile, though. We topped out here in the Southern California in September 2006, and there is very strong evidence of a 0.618.382 Fibonacci relationship in the data series, and that suggests August 2016, about a year and a half from now we should see the next peak in home prices. And then we'll head south once again. Let's review what we talked about here today. 
as you know, my focus is on cycles. I want to be forward predictive in my market work. I want to try to ascertain in advance where I think a significant high or low is going to occur. I found that cycles have their roots grounded in Fibonacci numerology, and by taking the Fibonacci series and dividing by the square root of five, I've been able to produce a tabular series of numbers, which I have found defines all of the cycles, all of the cycles we see in the markets in all time frames, years, months, weeks, days, hours, it doesn't matter. The same numbers appear over and over, time and time again. And we looked at uh, stocks, we looked at bonds, and we looked at home prices. Beautiful aircraft, that's the F-22. F-14 Tomcat, Eastern Mediterranean. There's my contact information. And looks like we're at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time here. I want to thank you. It's been my pleasure to be your guest. Reed, do we have any questions? Um, I'm seeing some that came in earlier. You have uh, three minutes if you'd like to take some time to uh, oh, okay. go back over those. Yeah, I'd be, it'd be my pleasure, sure. Absolutely. I did put your email address, and I'm about to put in your website uh, address as well to the entire audience. Okay. Could you uh, read the questions to me, please? Absolutely. Go up here. Okay, so I'm seeing one that came in from Mike. Um, it says, in a previous presentation, you indicated uh, in November of 2014 would be the potential stock market top. I assume this new revised peak of March 2015 is a revision. Uh, if the market does not peak in March, as you expect, when would the next most logical time period uh, projection be? Good question. Thank you. Um, we're, we're dealing with, on a broad scale, of cycles of almost 400 years, and then I attempt to narrow the, those down. Um, and in any form of data analysis, there, there's variance. There's standard deviation, and that's something that, it, as a data, an anal a data analyst and a statistician, there, there's no way around that. So what I do is I identify a swath of time and then look at smaller and smaller time scales to try to narrow that down. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an iterative process. Um, one has to look at the data and say, you know, I think this, this is my best case for when I think we're going to top out. If, if, if not, then, uh, then what is the next really strong confluence of numbers? What I have right now is, is, is the March time frame. I've been looking for the latter part of 2014, um, perhaps early into early 2015 as a high for some time. Now I'm leaning there very strongly. Uh, I don't think the top is in yet. It's possible it could have come in, uh, in late December, but I'm very skeptical of that. I think we have one more move up to go to top this thing off. The, the numbers and the cycles for that early March time period are very, very compelling. Uh, if we don't top out there, um, I have not identified a, a subsequent time window. I'll just need to look at things once we get there. But uh, from right now, I'm, I've got a bullish perspective on the markets. I think we're going to head higher. I think you're going to see the NASDAQ uh, at least tag the 5,000 area and very probably uh, challenge its uh, March 2000 high. Whether we take it out or not, I think uh, th that's not the issue. I think it's essentially going to be a double top. It's going to span about 15 years in duration. Um, 
but uh, let's let's wait and see uh, once we get to March what things look like. Um, and and uh, I contend that the, the very best tool any technician needs in this business is an eraser. All right, I got one from Gene. Um, asked when the Dow drops, how far do you predict it will go down? Um, again, a good question, uh, and I I can't answer that. Uh, I can hazard a guess, but uh, that would be kind of silly. Uh, the last two major sell-offs that, that were involved with the 79.6 month cycle took 50% off. Um, my guess is, uh, my, my reasonable guess is something on that same order, about half. We're looking at a major top here, um, and, uh, and it's not going to be that much different from what happened, say, in 1835. I hesitate to say 1929 because that took 90% off. It's going to be a significant haircut in the market. How much? I, I, I just don't know. We'll, uh, we'll have to wait for the, uh, the top to come in, the market to roll over, and I think the best money is going to be made on the short side, and we'll just take whatever Ms. Market delivers us. All right, and the last question we have time for uh, is uh, from Sanjeev. Uh, where does the dot-com burst? of 2007 um, fit into your chart? Well, the dot-com burst, I think most people probably associate that with the 2000 top. Um, then we had a subsequent top in 2007. Each of these peaks tend to come approximately six and a half to seven years. That's that 79.6 month cycle I talked about. Um, so seven years ago today, of course, was October of 07. Seven years prior to that was uh, the 2000 series of peaks. Prior to that, we had a high in January 94. Prior to that, we had a high in August of 87, and so on. So you can see each of those highs has come about six and a half to seven years with quite with considerable regularity, and we're right there again for the next peak to occur. So my challenge, of course, is pinning it down to the day. That's what I strive very hard to do, and that's what you all as investors and traders ought to be looking at as well.